Hello, uh, my name is Casey Foreman. I am a counseling psychologist practicing in South Africa, and I am very passionate about raising awareness, um, especially with regards to Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I know that we all wanted to meet in person. If you're watching this video, you probably wanted to meet uh, meet up in person, or perhaps you didn't know anything about um, about this um, seminar that we were meant to have in person. Um, but nevertheless, we still get to share and to connect online. And um, if you're here, if you're looking at this video right now, you're probably on the lookout for some more information, whether you're a family member, a parent, uh, a friend, or you are a, a, a patient, um, you are struggling with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you're looking for some more information. And um, this is the perfect platform for that. And I just want to commend you and say, you are obviously taking one step in the right direction and you're trying to inform and empower yourself. So that is, that is also never an easy task, but uh, I commend you on that. And I'm exceptionally passionate about Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, I practice in South Africa and um, I conducted my master's thesis on um, basically just the lived experiences of parents raising a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy because I wanted to find out more. Um, it's something that's very close to my heart um, for some personal reasons as well, um, but I, I I really sought out to 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 find out to really just encapsulate what does a day in the life of a parent look like? Someone who's living with uh, living with someone with DMD. So if this relates to you, then you're in the right place. Um, so firstly, just to define uh, DMD and muscular dystrophies, if this is very new to you, which it may be or may not, uh, muscular dystrophies are a group of genetic disorders that are characterized by a progressive muscle weakness that affects mobility. Um, there are differences in the various types of muscular dystrophy in the rate at which muscle weakness progresses and the muscle groups which are severely affected. And then, of course, Duchenne muscular dystrophy is the most severe form of muscular dystrophy with a prevalence of 1 in 3,500 male births, give or take, regardless of race or ethnic origin. Um, it's obviously a degenerative disease and it's inherited as an X-linked recessive disorder caused by a mutation or a lack of the protein dystrophin. So I'm not going to go into great detail there because... I'm not a medical doctor, I'm a psychologist, but it is important just to have a, an outline of what Duchenne muscular dystrophy is. Um, so obviously DMD causes progressive weakness by affecting all body muscles, and it usually leads to early death. But we've seen, and I've, I've met some incredible, incredible parents who have gone to all lengths to make sure that their boys live a very fulfilling, uh, life and and they've lived to adulthood. Um, these 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 boys have grown to, to 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 adults and they they are living very meaningful lives. Okay, so I, I I would love to just share a little bit about my research because my my primary goal was really just to to jump into um, these families' lives and find out what is it like. Um, and this is what I found and. Moreover, I've been I've been really really I've been hosting support groups. So please, if you'd like to get involved, there are amazing parents who have have children in this scenario and they've dealt with it for many years, and they are so 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 capable and um, passionate about raising awareness, especially in South Africa, and um, it's definitely needed. So they've decided, and I hope that um, Mina doesn't mind me sharing, um, but. Mina is one of my one of my closest friends, but also someone who I just really respect and, and admire. She's a mom of 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 a ten year old son with with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and she has been honestly she was devastated that we weren't having this conference in person, um, but for obvious reasons we couldn't, 
and we have decided that we would like to create our very own support group packages for parents, um, for, for anyone dealing with DMD. And this, in, this encapsulates what we need to know, which is the practicalities. Who do you contact? How do you contact them? When do you contact these people? And how do you deal with the grief associated with this di diagnosis? Um, some of these parents shared with me that um, grieving was incredibly difficult uh, and grief is still widely misunderstood. Uh, I see so many clients on a daily basis grieving, whether they've lost a family member or a friend, um, whether they anticipating losing someone, or whether, they've, you know, whether they are living day to day. Trying to make the best out of a situation that inevitably, inevitably will lead to death. So what I found out is that grief is not linear at all. Um, it's important for parents to, to plan in advance and gain practical information about the illness in order to implement necessary changes in their lives. But the adjustment process will be complicated. So if you're going through this right now, just know that it's, you're not in this alone and you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be trying to grapple with all these changes and losses, you know, loss of what you thought um, your child's life might look like, a loss of what your li you thought your life might look like, um, you know, all your goals and expectations of, of, of what you thought might have been. Um, obviously, that's a massive shock to just to just grapple with those massive adjustments and trauma, because it is a trauma that you're dealing with when you receive a diagnosis. Um, so right from receiving that the diagnosis of DMD to, to dealing with it every day, um, to anticipating the loss of a loved one, that's when you need to really seek out, uh, seek seek help from a psychologist, um, and not only a psychologist. Uh, that's a very important element, though, based on on the research I've done. That's normally um, something that parents, according to my research, put aside because they felt that they would rather deal with their child's primary concerns and I completely understand that because there's so many additional expenses they often have to look into changing their medical aids um, because obviously there's just so much more to consider um, due to you know taking regular steroids paying for physiotherapy um, it's an, an, a regular hospital visit so psychology is something that kind of takes a back seat and um, I, I understand, but I've also seen that that is possibly the most important thing you can do for yourself if you're in a situation where you are feeling quite hopeless, quite overwhelmed. Um, rather, just seek out help from a psychologist. Um, there's free services as well. I'd be very happy to share um, share, share the details of SADAC and Lifeline that um, not everyone knows about DMD and that's why I've made it my task and my goal to educate other healthcare professionals, especially psychologists and social workers, um, to learn more about DMD so that they are better equipped to help parents and to help clients and patients struggling with this. So amidst all this chaos, um, the you know what I really found though is that each family tried to they they their very best to create a meaningful life beyond the loss, and then that that should be the goal, not to try and live an easy life because it won't be. But it that doesn't mean it won't be meaningful, and um, just to remain hopeful about what lies ahead. So, I mean, you, you, please reach out to me. Uh, Mina and I, I have put together a list of um, amazing cardiologists in Gauteng. We're still working on, on other areas, but we will put our heads together. And that's the whole thing. We need to support each other through this. It's not, it, it, it's not something you can do on your own or fight on your own. And I don't want you to feel as if you're on your own. So um, if you're lost and you're looking for direction, reach out to me. Um, I, run, I run my own practice in, in Bryanston in Betterview and online and I'm, I'd be more than happy to just equip you with um, the name and number of a cardiologist, of a pediatric pulmonologist, of a pediatric neurologist and physiotherapist. And this has been kindly given to me, this information, by a parent um, who, who's raising a son with DMD. And um, she's really, she's felt so lost, so isolated, not knowing where to turn, what to do. 
and and she's found these people who have really helped so uh, i mean i also know that rare diseases sa i've currently joined um, I've joined that group as a healthcare professional and they're an amazing platform. Um, please look into Rare Diseases SA if you're looking just to find out about more uh, practical tips and tools and, and also uh, free counselling services. Um, it's quite limited but it, it does exist. And then um, yeah, different suppliers, who to see, uh, please reach out to me for a list of resources. And while I don't profess to be an absolute ex expert on anyone's life, um, I, I have noticed that external associations such as Muscular Dystrophy, um, such as the Muscular Dystrophy Foundation, sorry, of South Africa, they do exist to alleviate and assist with some of the emotional and practical challenges that parents experience. Um, but, but I did notice through my research that many professionals um, and families have acknowledged that healthcare professionals providing treatment in a hospital setting in South Africa find it almost impossible to provide the parents and their affected children with the necessary emotional support due to resource constraints. So this is not because they don't want to, it's just because they don't have the resources, they don't have the necessary resources, and there aren't enough trained psychologists, in all honesty, to help um, with this kind of condition. They simply just, they're not informed. And that's why if, if there is a psychologist watching this as well um, that would like to learn more about DMD, please get in touch with me so that we can collaborate and create um, resources and support groups and platforms to further engage in this topic, very important topic. Um, and then one of the most prominent psychological effects on parents um, in my study included the anticipation of a future stressor, so worrying about what is to come. What if? What if? Um, so you get caught in that cycle of anxiety and those intrusive thoughts around everything going wrong and around the unpredictability of the disease because it is so unpredictable. So it's very scary. Um, and if you think about what happens when, when we can get caught in that cycle of anxiety and negative intrusive thoughts, our brain goes into fight, fly, flight or freeze mode. Our central nervous system shuts down. And our amygdala, which is our emotional sense of the brain, pretty much hijacks the functioning of our brain. So we aren't able to think clearly, to make rational decisions as we would normally do when we're in a state like this. So imagine how overwhelmed one must be when they receive this diagnosis. And if this is you and you've just received this very, very, very traumatic diagnosis, I encourage you to, to reach out because no one can do this alone. And I say this because parents were asked to identify what they experienced as the major, major problem of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in their eyes. And the majority of families identified a psychological problem as a major stressor rather than physical issues, which you would kind of think would be the major problem, such as lifting, carrying, turning, um, you know, all the practical practicalities. But it boils down to feeling like you cannot cope, feeling overwhelmed. Um, some of the reactions of the, of this diagnosis include, you know, frustrations with the, me the, the medical fraternity in South Africa. Some parents noted that they received incorrect diagnoses. They were sent from pillar to post and no one could really tell them what was wrong with their son. And if, if this sounds like you, if this is something you're struggling with at the moment, trust your intuition. But also um, reach out to us, reach out to this foundation, reach out to parents that have already found amazing professionals to assist them on this journey. Um, reach out to, to myself or another social worker or psychologist and, and just know that you don't have to find out everything and do everything on your own. So you can just imagine not being correctly diagnosed um, and then when you are when you do receive this diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, just the immense shock and the profound sense of loss. Um, you know why didn't any doctor or specialist or uh, pediatrician pick up this earlier? Why was I sent to so many different professionals? And I don't think it is that the, the professionals have any ill intentions. There's some amazing people 
in Cape Town at the Red Cross Clinic, some amazing professionals and physios and pulmonologists that have assisted some, uh, some of these parents. But it's, the point is it took so long for them to find these professionals. Um, so participants in my study described their consistent disappointments and frustrations uh, with the medical fraternity in South Africa. Another theme in my study was facing the loss. So anticipatory loss was a major theme. And I'm sure most of you have heard of, or maybe perhaps not, of Kubler-Ross's stage theory of grief. So a lot of psychologists refer to this, but a lot of people widely know the different stages such as denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, supposedly being the final stage when you've accepted the loss and you've you've learned to live with it. Um, but throughout my study, parents seem to vacillate between hope and intermittent, intermittent periods of grieving, uh, avoidance of the fact that their son will finally die, and then presence as well. So they really, I, I, I could see this even as they were talking to me. It, they really did vacillate between I'm hopeful, I'm grieving, I don't want to think about it all the time that they're going to die eventually. And I want to be present. I want to live each day as if it were their last. And I want to find meaning in their everyday lives. And I thought that was just so, so amazing that they still, um, amidst all of the turmoil, the emotional turmoil, the loss, the grief, uh, to, to finally actually find a way of finding meaning, whether that is through just everyday interactions. Um, you know, after all, whoever you're raising, whoever's struggling with DMD, they're a human being like all of us. They just happen to have this illness. There's nothing more to it. Um, they, they, they're still growing through different stages of development in their lives. And um, I've met some incredibly special, intelligent young men and boys uh, living with DMD. And they're living incredibly meaningful lives. And they've advocated as well uh, for you know, just awareness, support, integration. Um, instead of isolation and exclusion. So another one of the major themes that I um, highlighted in my study was appraisal of the illness, um, you know, learning to adapt, living with the illness, but also just how parents appraise the illness, um, some of their daily challenges, um, and looking at avoidance versus presence, and then support versus isolation. I found that numerous studies have shown that a parent's appraisal of an uncertainty in particular undeniably affects their ability to cope. So I mean, we're all different. We all have different appraisals of uncertainty. Some of us embrace change a bit more readily than others. And this this is part and parcel of your personality, you know, and, and, and your childhood experiences and your genetics. So uncertainty is usually, but not always, um, perceived as a danger or a threat. I mean, let's face it, being uncertain about what the future holds is often quite scary. And in some instances, parents have alluded to the fact that uncertainty allows for a sense of hopefulness, which is which was amazing for me to find out, and, and a possibility for future outcomes for their affected child. So there's no uniform way of adapting to life after, after the diagnosis is made. And the cognitive appraisal of a situation is likely to play a role in the process of adaptation. So how quickly are you going to accept this diagnosis and start making the necessary changes, start reaching out for help, start reaching out to a support group, start finding out what is required of you now, what practical changes do you have to make to your everyday life? How often do you have to see a physiotherapist? How often does your son have to take steroids? These are all questions you can start asking yourself and start implementing once you've, you've, you know, you've grappled with this diagnosis. And it doesn't all happen at once. You can go back and forth. One thing I can say with confidence is that all of the parents reiterated how crucially important it is to go to every effort to raise awareness. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm really trying to embody that. I'm trying to manifest that, that awareness, but also the empowerment that comes with just, just raising awareness, being there, being the light at the end of the tunnel for parents, for children, for anyone 
that wants to know more about DMD or is struggling to come to terms with it. So one of the last themes in my study uh, was trying to look beyond the illness um, and turning pain into hope and finding meaning. So for me, this, this spoke to the concept of existentialism. And if you're interested in this, I can send you some amazing resources and books written by Viktor Frankl. And he, he is an amazing psychologist who dedicated his life to studying existentialism, studying what it's like to find meaning through suffering. And uh, you know what, when, when you're thinking about seeking out a therapist, for example, a psychologist, I want you to know that there's no one size fits all when it comes to DMD, but overall, any concern that clients come to me with, with their presenting problem, you know, there's no, you, you don't have to connect, you don't have to feel as if you need to connect, or if you don't, then you're a failure at that too. Therapy is a very personal process. It's a very vulnerable process to go through, especially when you're dealing with a diagnosis of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So don't be hard on yourself when you go for a session and you don't feel any better. It'll probably take a long time before you start to feel comfortable with your therapist. And if you don't, that's okay. Uh, therapy is a reflective process and, and it's really important to know that despite all the chaos and the challenges, you, you don't need to go through this alone. Your psychologist, your therapist, your social worker can really help you with the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. Moments when you feel devastated, um, I mean, some of the changes will be devastating. Um, this is a progressive disorder. So at, in, at some points in your life, you might feel like there is no hope. My son is going to die and that's a fact. Um, but I mean, research, has shown and, and, and early intervention has shown and I've met boys um, and, and adult boys living with DMD that have well surpassed um, the age that we're meant to live to. I've, I've, I've met some, um, boys that have lived to the age of 23 years old. Um, you know, I mean, but at the end of the day, you're still grappling with grief, probably on a daily basis. And you know what stages these stages of grief, see them as a sort of scaffolding rather than set in stone and progressing from one stage to the next. So as you deal with acceptance, uh, you'll find that there is so much meaning, you know, if you once you're going through those denial phases that you can really be, you can really find yourself in quite a dark, dark, dark space. And, and you don't want to go through this on your own. It's very scary. But when, when you, when you deal with the acceptance of the loss, you'll find you'll find meaning and that'll be beautiful for you and you know what you'll re start realizing that their lives matter their death also matters but their lives matter so you know what i think as human beings we want grief to be a linear process because we want it to be clear we want it to be clearly defined once i progress through this stage to, from denial to anger to bargaining to depression and then to acceptance then i'll be okay and you're waiting for that to happen but you know what, sometimes hearts stay broken. Sometimes we grieve for longer than we, we expect to. And you know what, I think there should be a lot of normalizing around the grieving, pro grieving process because there, at this point in time, grief is something that human beings just don't know how to deal with. And I'm saying that from a very personal uh, point of view, but also just, just seeing my clients struggle with it. Being vulnerable is something that we're not, it's not, we're not conditioned to be vulnerable. We're conditioned to, to be strong, to not show our feelings, to not be emotional. And um, if, if you find yourself in a spot where you feel that being vulnerable means you are weak, I would really encourage you to read some of Brene Brown's books or listen to some of her podcasts. She's an amazing social worker. Uh, I think she's a clinical social worker and she's, she's dedicated her life um, to research on shame and vulnerability and if we can if we can see the courage in vulnerability if we can see that we are so courageous to reveal our insecurities to reveal our vulnerabilities that could really just change the narrative 
And what's really wonderful now for us as South Africans is now that, and the world, but especially us as South Africans, we can socialize, we can interact more. And that means that we're opening up support groups. We're opening up in-person interactions because as one of the parents rightly pointed out to me, doing things online and having online support groups are wonderful, but sometimes there might be a parent who's a bit more introverted or is a bit more vulnerable or doesn't know how to ask a question, you know, in the context of MS Teams or a Zoom meeting, and they would like to just come up to me at the end of a, a group session and ask a couple of questions. And, you know, I think that there's still some beauty in in-person interactions, groups. So she pointed out that she didn't often feel comfortable just opening up and asking all these questions on online platforms. So I would encourage you to reach out and um, I'm not only doing these workshops on my own, I'm going to be doing it with one of the parents of, of a son with a DMD who has a wealth of knowledge and wisdom and experience. And she's still grappling with grief on a day-to-day -day basis, but she is completely phenomenal and you won't go wrong if you just reach out for help when you need it. And if you have lost a child, um, you know what, I mean, a child's loss is there's nothing more painful than that um, you know a child's loss can lead to many things it can also lead to a divorce but not necessarily i often find that the judgment of each other's loss is what leads to a divorce or it leads to parents growing apart um, and you really want you really want to work together through this and support each other through this so even couples counseling could be an important part of your journey um, other books you might consider reading or looking into to reading. Um, I love reading and just learning more about grief and especially DMD. Um, is just one, one on grief in particular. It's called It's Okay to Not Be Okay. Um, and that's, you know, meeting grief and loss in a culture that simply doesn't understand. Uh, I, I'm happy to send you these names or to list them below. And then, of course, Brene Brown. So... Um, in particular, she has many books, but Daring Greatly, so How the Courage to Be Vulnerable transforms the way we live, love, parent, and lead. The other book I really loved of hers is Rising Strong. And the last one is The Gifts of Imperf Imperfection. So learning to let go of who you think you're supposed to be and then to just embrace who you are. So perhaps you had all these ideas of where you thought your life would be going or the direction I was speaking to a parent um, of a child with DMD just the other day and she said to me you know I just thought I would be further in my life right now I thought I would be finished with my degree I thought I would be more successful and be more financially stable but because of this because of my circumstances because of my husband's circumstances everything's going towards our medical aid and nothing is really left for me for me to, uh, to to be my own person to achieve the goals that I sought out to achieve so it's really 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 challenging and I, I see you and I acknowledge that all these challenges are exceptionally difficult and traumatic um, I'm not dismissing them whatsoever but I do want to say if you're watching this video and you're obviously you're brave enough and courageous enough and vulnerable enough to to reach out you know in some way even if it's just through an online platform um, and for any professionals watching this video whether that be um, psychologists in particular or other prof healthcare professionals it's really important to appreciate that parents instincts are usually right and to not dismiss their concerns um, so whether this relates to the diagnosis or the progression of the disease or palliative care, I think it's very important or, and it's very beneficial for psychologists, nurses, social workers um, um, to work collaboratively with parents to run a program to build on internal resource, resources and coping strategies because that's where the magic is, right? You can have all the external supports in the world, but if you don't feel that you can manage and your, your internal toolbox and your internal resources um, is really, really, really just, you feel incapable, you feel incompetent, then you're never going to really feel that you can cope with whatever situation comes your way. 
Um, and I help a lot with that through cognitive behavioral therapy, through building your own toolbox because you're the expert of your own life, um, teaching you to empower yourself and unleash your potential whatever with whatever situation you're going through. Um, so I think it would be useful overall, I've noticed, to teach effective communication and conflict management as well as self as well as self-care to these families because if you're a parent of a child with DND, you'll know that you don't have much free time. You're going from physio appointment to physio appointment to hospital to back home again to doing your stretches. Um, there's very little time for you to take care of yourself. And I really want you to start being curious about what's going on in your mind. Are you making decisions out of a place of self-love? Or are you making decisions based on something else, like always needing to care for others? And I understand that this isn't always a choice that you can easily make, but there are resources available, you know, whether free, whether online therapy, and I offer discounted rates as well to some parents. There are ways that you can practice self-care with the little time that you do have. Um, you know, and also self-care, you know, this, this would also encourage parents to voice their major challenges and help and have them addressed in a group setting. So if they feel that they're able to take care of themselves just enough to, to raise awareness and to, to participate um, and, to, and to engage uh, with other parents in a similar situation about how important self-care is, I really think that that could make such a big difference, especially in South Africa. Um, you know, I mean, speaking about that, you know, it's, it's also important to consider each family's financial position and to offer personalized support to ensure that each family receives assistance. So I know that this is easier said than done, but that's why psychologists and support groups exist so that we can help each other, you know, whether it's raising funds, starting starting to you know to, to, to raise funds for a cause uh, we can do that we don't need the massive organizations to help us all the time if each of us put our minds together and brainstorm ideas we can we can also raise awareness and funds to support families in need so um so most importantly uh, professionals need to offer practical suggestions for working through the initial shock and reassure parents that there is no right way to grieve. So the practical suggestions that I mentioned in, in the very beginning is who do I contact? Uh, and that you can really find out from me. Uh, I've got a list of a few professionals in Gauteng that, that are assisting a couple of parents that I know. And I'm still learning and growing as I go along, so I don't know everything. But I do know that additional support could include organizing events for parents and forming more support groups. So this is your chance, whether you're a parent, whether you're a healthcare professional, to get involved, to reach out, to join the, the Muscular Dystrophy so Association, um, to join Rare Diseases SA, and together we can make a difference. So uh, just to conclude, uh, I really want to thank you for your time, for watching this video, and for really, really just knowing that you don't need to embrace this exceptionally challenging time on your own. Um, if anything, I, I, I commend you for reaching out, for watching this, and I hope to work collaboratively with parents and with sons with Duchenne muscular dystrophy in a way that empowers and, and encourages the whole family unit and the DMD patient to fulfill your aspirations, you know, to, to fulfill whatever aspirations, whatever goals you have, you know, before it's too late, before you regret the decisions that you've made, before you just isolate yourself, which does happen, it, it really does when you're going through a difficult time. I speak, for, I speak for myself, but I've seen that many of my clients do isolate, they withdraw, they feel that they don't want to be a burden to others. But if, the more you do that, the more depressed, the more hopeless the situation becomes. So I, 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 I'm here if you'd like to reach out to me, but there's, there's so many psychologists out there and what, what you really need is empathy and to know that you're not alone. Thank you.